I was very pleased when I was browsing through the military periodicals in WH Smith the other day, as you do, to pick up uh, Military Illustrated, I think it was, and see the WFA's latest recruitment uh, publicity. And it began with the line, was the Somme a victory or a defeat? Uh, so it shows yes, that someone at least in the WFA has read the book. Uh, I'm not going to talk today about the Somme per se, assuming uh, everybody else has read it as well. But I think this sets up very well what I want to talk about uh, this morning, uh, I think actually now this afternoon. Uh, I've deliberately chose a provocative title when John Bourne asked me to speak to you today. He said, can you look at 1916? And I thought, well, everyone has an opinion of 1916, so let's uh, try and challenge their perspectives. So my title is 1916, uh, Year of Victory. Uh, and I think it's provocative for two reasons. Firstly, how does one actually define victory in a war of this uh, nature? Secondly, how can a year as notorious as 1916 ever be considered to be victorious? We know 1916 is the year of Verdun, uh, and particularly the year of the Somme in this country. It's also the year of Jutland. It's also the year of the disaster at Kut in Mesopotamia. Uh, it's also climaxes with the defeat of a new ally, uh, Romania. Or at least, more actually, the occupation of a new ally, Romania, but not the defeat. The Romanian army uh, remains in the field till 1918. It's not obviously a year of victories. Come December, the trench lines in France and in Italy and at Salonica are more or less where they were in January. In the East, uh, successes achieved by the Russians uh, have been checked and reversed. Nonetheless, I'm going to argue uh, today that it was the decisive year of the war and that there were many more victories than first appear. General Henry Wilson, uh, you probably know uh, most notoriously for being the man who drew up the plan to send the British Army to France in 1914, uh, by the end of 1917, he's lost his corps command in France. He's back in London, kicking his heels, trying to find something to do with himself. But he writes a very important diary. And at the end of 1917, he notes the last, sorry, sorry, the end of 1916, uh, the last day of a year of indecisive fighting. Verdun, the Somme, Greece and Romania all indecisive. Both sides claiming victory. On the whole victory inclining to us and the final decision brought nearer. I want to try and tell you today why Henry Wilson reached this conclusion and how accurate it was. But to do this, uh, we need to think big, I think. We need to think strategy. Too often we engage with 1960, indeed a lot of the war, from the dimensions of politics or of tactics. We need to step out of the trenches, we need to step out of the cabinet office or the conference room. We need to think big, uh, and I'm very pleased that our first speaker, Dr. Bushaway, has set up very much the war as I want to engage with it now, a war of rival alliances, uh, and we're not simply now dealing with Britain's war. We're dealing with what has become, by the end of 1915, very much uh, a world war. We need to appreciate that in 1916, for the first time, the properly mobilised resources of the Allies would finally be engaged against the resources of Germany and her allies, the, the Central Powers. They'd be engaged haltingly. They'd be engaged, I think, inefficiently. Yet they would be engaged directly and, as far as they got so far, fully for the first time. Kitchener, uh, Britain's Secretary of State for War, made an oft-quoted remark, uh, I think he made the remark on a number of occasions, that the war would only really start in 1916 after two years when Britain's resources were fully mobilised. And I think Kitchener was one of the more prescient uh, strategists of the war. Uh, he didn't make this remark 18 months in, he made it very early on, or at least I think he made it early on in 1915 when the stalemate set in, but by that point he'd already been preparing Britain's resources, Britain's armies uh, for six months with a view to engaging them in a long war of attrition. Uh, the idea perhaps that these armies were to win the peace when his allies had done the fighting is possibly not really uh, fair. I think Kitchener was aware that the two rival alliances would fight themselves to a stalemate 
and Britain's resources would have to do a fair share of the fighting before that stalemate would be uh, resolved. But what's going to happen in 1916 with the proper engagement of resources is that the nature of war is going to change and at the same time the fortunes of war are going to change over the course of the year. We have in 1915 clearly uh, a series of false starts, hopes at quick fixes. Uh, although the war was not over by Christmas, there it does persist in 1915. I think it actually persists well after 1916 among some people that the war will go on for another six months. You often see this written down in strategic papers. We'll do this and the war is going to end in six months. Uh, but there are no quick fixes to this war. Uh, the amateur strategists of 1915 have tried some quick fixes. Uh, if anything, they've just worsened the Entente's uh, position. Maybe the quick fix of defeating Russia on the German side was equally uh, unproductive. So belligerents, by 1916, as they sit down to review the military situation, are adapting to the unexpected strategic stalemate in a way that they hadn't done in early 1915, when the amateur strategists, uh, for good or ill, get their hand on things. Therefore, in the, the second, or moving into the third year of war, these approaches are rejected in favour of a concerted, a consistent, strategic approach. For want of a better definition, we can call this a war of attrition. And this is an approach common to both alliances in the war. I hope no one is be, be surprised when I say this is a war of attrition. Everyone knows that the First World War was a war of attrition. But my worry is that few people actually understand what a war of attrition actually is and what it entails. You need to do three things in a war of attrition to uh, win. You need to outproduce, you need to outfight, and you need to outlast your enemies. How are you going to do this? Firstly, you must mobilise and efficiently manage your own resources and indeed those of your allies. Central to this is manpower and as the war goes on, uh, woman power as well. This is sustained by your industrial and financial capacity. Thirdly, you have to mobilise what we'd call today, I suppose, hearts and minds. Partly it's a question of sustaining military morale in the fighting forces, but also it's a question of maintaining popular support for the war effort, uh, belief in the cause on the home front. So that's part one. It's the war, what we'd call the war effort has to be uh, engaged properly and appropriately. Secondly, there's war making itself. What you're trying to do is to attack and to destroy your enemy's resources. Attrition centrally focuses on uh, the enemy's manpower, but also you're grinding down his material resources, his ability to produce more material, uh, his economic stability, and the morale of his armed forces and civilians on the home front. And the third factor, possibly not give enough emphasis, but very important, is what I would call uh, resilience. You, you, both sides are doing the same thing. One has got to outlast the other. Uh, this resilience will ultimately define how long what has become a, law, a long war is going to last. Uh, I like William Robertson's definition of this in uh, November 1916. He talks of the staying power in men. He understands that human resources ultimately are the key to how this war is going to be conducted and decided. Uh, I think he's referring specifically to how many men that the, can be mobilised. I think also between the lines it's whether the men who are mobilised can, can stand the war. Uh, and it comes back to uh, jo 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 Joffrey's uh, comment, I think, that Dr Bushaway uh, concluded with uh, before me. But staying power also includes staying power and economic strength. Can you afford to carry on this war? 
as well as uh, domestic patriotic commitment to the war. Uh, and if staying power does not uh, last, you're going to find yourself, I suppose, in uh, the scenario that I think was anticipated on both sides, uh, a so-called piece of exhaustion, a compromise because this can't carry on with the expectation this will be a breathing space and the war will be resumed at a later point. How is it best to try and understand the nature and dynamics of a war of attrition, uh, understanding its component elements? Conventionally, this is a war of fronts. Uh, but we need to think not of geographic fronts, the western, the eastern, the southern, etc., but we need to think of five interconnected uh, fronts that are all engaged in uh, the strategic uh, realisation of ambitions on both sides of the, uh, the line. Uh, firstly, there's the home front, of course. This tends to be a sort of a World War II concept, but very much there was, by 1916, mobilised home fronts on both sides. It has been argued, uh, the French uh, historian Remy Porte, for example, published a book on France's industrial, mo France industrial mobilisation a few years ago called La Mobilisation Industrielle, La Première Front de la Grande Guerre, the first front of the war, arguing that it was what you did on the home front in terms of mobilisation of industry, in terms of producing armaments, munitions for your armed forces, that was ultimately going to be decisive on the battlefield, not the tactics or operational methods uh, there, are, there adopted. Although uh, you have to refine that by identifying that you can have as much material as you like. If you don't use it properly, it's not going to give you uh, the right advantage. But maybe it's the factories that are determinant of... Uh, advantage in this war, uh, as well as factories, I suppose, the mines and the fields. Can you produce the wherewithal for industrialised armies to fight high-intensity warfare, which it is becoming in 1916 and 17? And on the other side of this coin, can you undermine the enemy's domestic economy and the enemy's domestic resolve? Bear in mind, you don't have strategic bombing uh, in this war, or as you have it in, in embryo, I suppose, with German raids on uh, the British Isles, but uh, other means would have to be adopted for engaging with and undermining the enemy's home front. The second of our five fronts is that of diplomacy. Essentially, this amounts to the contest for neutral opinion, coupled with an effort to expand the number of friendly belligerents. Uh, Linked to this is the possibility of securing war aims or favourable peace terms should it come to a compromised peace settlement. Thirdly, the war is conducted on a maritime front at sea. Control of the seas is central to the principle of an attritional maritime strategy. Whether you call it blockade or what the uh, British Admiralty like to call economic warfare because it has dimensions which extend beyond what the navies themselves do, to how you control uh, trading and financial engagement uh, with the enemy through uh, neutral uh, states. Uh, but this, although we tend to dwell on the land campaigns, is vital to a war of attrition. Germany can contest Allied superiority at sea with her fleet in being strategy, she can attempt a counter blockade with submarines. Control of the sea also gives you flexibility in land operations. Although against essentially a land-centred alliance, uh, it, this has its limitations, it has its distractions. Should you pursue a peripheral strategy, essentially what's going on in 1915, or should you focus your attention, uh, your effort and resources at the perceived decisive point, uh, which for Joffre and others was the Western Front. The fourth front, what I call the United Front. You have to keep your alliance together. Coalition war is more difficult than national war, but I think that the strength in unity exceeds the freedom uh, 
of an alliance in which one power is predominant or of the freedom of an individualistic strategy. There are different alliance structures. Uh, the Entente essentially is a great power alliance of what we might identify as equals, uh, Russia, Britain, France and Italy, with a number of associated smaller states who don't have much say in strategic policy making but whose uh, interests have to be acknowledged and taken into account in alliance strategy. Uh, Belgium and Serbia are the most important uh, at the beginning of the year. Romania uh, is added in later. The Central Powers have a different alliance structure. They're more dominated by the most powerful member, Germany. Uh, they have a geographic advantage too. They are geographically united and contiguous. The Entente has to, as it were, work on divided fronts, western, eastern, southern, and uh, Middle Eastern. Uh, to the disadvantage of the central powers, increasingly Austria-Hungary is it divided uh, against itself as the war goes on. And these, fours, these four fronts are significant, the home front, diplomatic front, maritime front, and united front, but ultimately they are all supporting the land front, the land war. This is where you're going to engage with and defeat the enemy's armed forces in the field. This is central to strategy, and we have five geographical fronts, western, southern, eastern, uh, Salonika, and I would guess the whole Middle East you might count as a front, the war against Turkey. Uh, and these five geographical fronts are competing for the resources provided by the home front uh, for attention of the diplomats, for uh, maritime uh, communication, transportation support, and for the attention of the various uh, allies in the uh, conference room. So the other four fronts are all linked into this structure. Having set that up, uh, I want to try and run through how the war in, in, was engaged with on these five fronts in 1916 and how this contrib contributed to the Entente's push for victory. Uh, firstly, the home front. Mobilisation was certainly a stop-start business in 1915. Partly because it hadn't been expected. Mainly because they hadn't done it before. And mainly because they were competing interests of uh, peacetime society that had to be engaged with and brought into the, uh, the war effort. Central to this was the appropriate distribution of manpower between the field armies, and home production for the war effort. Proved challenging to adapt a private enterprise economy to the needs of the state in wartime. There were certainly time lags in production that resulted. It was quite clear what sort of war was going to develop in 1914, and large orders were placed for munitions, armaments, with respect to fighting that sort of war. But it was going to take the best part of a year, 18 months in some cases, in Britain's case, which had further to go in mobilisation, for these munitions, armaments programmes to start delivering on a suitable scale to support the armies in the field. So armies fighting in 1915, effectively I say, are, are fighting with one arm tied behind their back because they don't have the necessary material resources to engage the enemy directly and properly. What also comes out of this stop-start experience in 1915 is a more effective system of procurement. And it allows continued expansion uh, for the second half of the war. You're not going to have the material shortages from 1916 that you have uh, in 1915. Essentially, the rivalries of private enterprise capitalism and unionised labour have to be resolved, uh, temporary at least, they don't last uh, throughout the war or indeed into peacetime, uh, and the government has to step in uh, to set up, uh, if those of you who probably uh, around the 70s remember the idea of corporatism, uh, the state has to manage the relations between unions and employers. And it seemed to uh, work after a fashion. Uh, by 1916, 
organised labour is very much behind the war effort. Certainly in Britain, for example, uh, workers are quite prepared to give up their bank holidays to produce munitions for uh, the ongoing Somme offensive. But this involves granting a range of concessions, uh, social and economic, to uh, organised labour, uh, mainly increasing wages and uh, making agreements on uh, working practices, but also significantly limiting the profits of capital, uh, which makes this a fractious and a potentially untenable compromise in the long run. But it's working well enough in 1916 to suggest that the home front is properly engaged in all its component parts in the war effort. We have a state-managed war effort, uh, not just in Britain, but in France and uh, in Germany. Uh, It's accepted by all, and it's increasingly functional. Means that from mid-1916, armies can rely on getting what they want to fight the sorts of battles that they are trying to fight. There's even some success in production in Russia. Uh, It's a fact that Russia manufactured more field guns than Britain in 1960, after a rather shaky start. Uh, It's also a fact that Russia lost an awful lot of field guns to the Germans in 1915, so uh, even with this increased production, it was difficult to keep uh, Russian armies adequately supplied in guns and munitions. On the other side, Germany was also well mobilised by the middle of 1916. But it became clear in the second half of that year that she could not match the Allied material slakta, material battle methods, uh, with a deeper mobilisation of her own. She tried with the Hindenburg programme uh, and the auxiliary service law of December 1916 to try to reach deeply into German manpower reserves. But ultimately this programme was not successful because it was quite clear when they tried to do this that actually there wasn't much left, uh, much depth left in the German uh, war economy that had reached its peak, more or less, by uh, the middle of 1916. So in a war in which mobilisation and resilience count so much, the Entente proved to have more of both on the home front. Uh, The exception of this, of course, will turn out to be Russia, Uh, The Italian, French and British home fronts got better uh, from uh, 1916 into 1917. Uh, And arguably in the Central Powers, uh, they got worse thereafter. So there's a clear shift on this front. Secondly, on the diplomatic front. Expanding the coalition itself had been central to diplomatic strategy in 1915, as uh, Bob Bushaway has indicated. By the end of that year, the Central Powers had reached its full extent with the adhesion of Bulgaria. No one from that point wanted to join Germany. It didn't look good. States still joined the Entente. Uh, Romania's entry in September was certainly a coup for the Entente diplomatically, although taking a long time, and it's true that Romania still thought she was fighting a 19th probably probably an 18th century war, I think, Uh, turned out they were ill-prepared for actually fighting the modern war. They were strategically vulnerable given their position. But if this was a last hurrah for old diplomacy, it was quite clear that the Entente still had something to offer uh, uncommitted states in a way that Germany did not. Uh, Greece joined in 1917, possibly slightly reluctantly, and was manoeuvred into it, but at the same time, the Entente could still recruit new states uh, thereafter. German diplomacy, I think, is increasingly moribund amongst the neutrals by 1916. A classic example, I think, is the famous Zimmermann telegram, uh, exposed uh, a German attempt to form an aggressive alliance against the United States with Mexico, of all states, uh, uh, and I think they wanted wanted to separate the Japanese from uh, the Entente side and get them in as well. Uh, This was clearly a bungled and rather fanciful diplomatic initiative at the end of the year on behalf of Germany. Neutral opinion was all important, and effectively this meant what way was the United States 
shifting. America was never going to enter the war, the European war, as they called it, in an election year. But the war was central to the campaigns of the American election. It's clear from the election campaigns where America's sympathies now lie. In practice, the American approach to the war had been one of diplomatic intervention to protect American and neutral interests, coupled with an attempt to bring the, both sides to the peace table. There was a reluctance to explore the possibilities of military engagement with either side, though it's quite clear that if military engagement was going to take place, it would be on the Entente side, not on the German side. But it was clear by 1916 that American financial and business interests had heavily invested in the Entente war effort and hence they were invested in an Entente victory. It wouldn't do American business any good if the Entente was beaten. But the problem with this investment was that it did mean uh, that if anything could force the Entente to a premature compromise peace, it was American economic strength and power rather than German uh, military success at this point, I think. The Entente was lucky that Germany would not offer realistic terms uh, in response to President Wilson's uh, peace initiative after he had been elected. And this served further to strengthen the Entente's diplomatic position uh, with America, even if the Entente itself was remaining pretty cagey about its own war aims and peace terms at this point. On the maritime front, economic warfare and blockade were slow working weapons. They embroiled both sides, uh, but much more so the Entente, which imposed a distant blockade on Germany uh, in the North Sea and the Channel, in a diplomatic minefield with neutrals over issues such as rights of passage through the North Sea and the Mediterranean and the problem of the re-export of commodities through the Central Powers, which were becoming increasingly uh, restricted. It took time for the principles of blockade to be codified in 1915 and for the practices to be implemented and the impacts to be felt. It was a very leaky blockade in 1915, and I'm afraid to say this in Birmingham, but a certain company, Cadbury's of Bourneville, very much increased its cocoa exports to Scandinavia in 1915. Uh, and I don't think the, uh, the Swedish had taken to uh, drinking more chocolate at that point. But by 1916... The German and Austro-Hungarian front is start, home front is starting to feel the impact of the blockade on things such as diet. Uh, rationing is introduced of uh, key foodstuffs, for example, on industrial output and on civilian morale. Nothing like a bread queue for people to start talking and complaining and uh, grumbling about the war. We can't point, as it were, to a moment of victory on this front. It's a slow working, uh, steady uh, shift from one way to the other. But such developments, I think, are clearly reinforcing the trend towards entente advantages on the home front. Germany cannot break the blockade with her own sea power. This situation had existed since German surface raiders had been cleared from the sea at the turn of 1914-15. And this was confirmed by the only naval engagement of the war, the Battle of Jutland, in the middle of 1916. Uh, this was certainly a tactically flawed uh, battle by the Royal Navy. In this engagement, Jellicoe, who, as Churchill famously said, was the only man who could lose the war in the afternoon, he didn't. And that's the most important thing we should recognise. This strengthened the maritime stranglehold on Germany. Submarine warfare, although a nuisance in 1916, was not going to reverse the fortunes of the sea war as long as Germany refrained from unrestricted submarine warfare to avoid exacerbating neutral hostility. Uh, we've heard that she tried it in 1915, but it didn't uh, last. Similarly, the Entente, the Entente was well able to keep its own war effort supplied and feed its population adequately 
during 1916. If there were some restrictions, they weren't as draconian uh, as those in the, uh, in the Central Powers. Then there's the United Front. Can the Allies work more effectively together than they had in 1915? And indeed, can they actually work more collaboratively and efficiently on their individual home fronts? Which I think is part of uh, this uh, theme. Every country, when war broke out, had adopted what I'd call a principle of political neutrality. Uh, the Union Sacre in France uh, worked between British political parties that was to translate into Asquith's coalition in May 1915. Even the Russians, uh, the Tsar was making some concessions to liberals in the Duma by 1915-16 in order to uh, promote better war management. On the other hand, cracks are starting to show in the Bergfrieden, the German uh, social peace by 1916. Politics is being undermined in Germany by uh, left-wing dissent and civil military relations worsening with the rise of military dictatorship. Uh, the French uh, scholar Francois Cayoteau has written a very interesting book called Gone et la Grande Guerre, which of course no one has read because it's in French, but he argues that one of the advantages uh, that underpinned uh, the outcome of the war was that the Entente had a democratic advantage over the authoritarian militarist approach to uh, the war of, or, or of controlling the war of the Central Powers and Germany in particular. And I think there's a lot to be said to this. The Entente adapted to the strains of war by developing more towards participatory democracy in their home front structures, while the Entente, sorry, sorry while the Central Powers uh, fell the other way to a more militaristic, authoritarian, centralised approach, which was again going to shift the balance uh, towards one side. Uh, by 1916, on the other hand, Austria and Hungary are effectively running separate war efforts and competing against themselves for increasingly scarce resources. At the alliance level, uh, there's a centralisation of strategic direction at French headquarters under General Joffre in December 1915, uh, the immediate response to the chaos of setting up the Salonika expedition, but a long-term recognition that running a war by national proclivities and by uh, what you might call peacetime government departments wasn't working anymore. Essentially, Joffre was to advise allied political councils. Uh, this was some way from the Supreme War Council system that occurred or was set up at the end of 1917. It had no executive secretariat, for example, but certainly by the turn of 1916, there did exist an embryonic machinery for running a coalition war effort on the Entente side and for coming up with and pushing forward a single coordinated strategic approach to uh, winning the war. There was still some concern debate about where responsibility actually lay for strategy. Was Joffre Allied Strategic Director or was he simply Allied Strategic Advisor? and political councils would have to endorse uh, the soldiers' plans. But there certainly there's a very significant step in coordination on the Entente Alliance side uh, over the winter of 1915-16. Those are the four supporting fronts. But fundamentally, all this activity is linked to more effective prosecution of the war on the land fronts. I think the Entente gained advantage on all those four fronts in 1916, but none of them alone, or even collectively, I think, was going to end the war. They had to be combined with success in the field. Success in the field was not possible unless you were successful on the other fronts, however. So it's a, it's a bit of a chicken and an egg situation we are faced with. And I think Germany's leaders, too, appreciated this. It may seem, if you step back and look at the war at the end of 1915, that Germany, or the Central Powers, had all the advantages. Or if not having the advantages, they are at least holding their own on the other four fronts at the start of 1916. And they retained the initiative in the land war after checking Joffre's 1915 Western Front offensives, after driving uh, the Russians out of Poland, 
after thwarting the Allied attack on the Dardanelles and containing the landing at Salonika. But that's not going to win the war for Germany. Falcon 9 has to take uh, what I call a gamble, but he has to take the strategic initiative. He has to launch a land campaign to force the Allies to the peace table in 1916 uh, before it's too late. He can see that the Allies are gaining advantages uh, elsewhere. A defensive stance is only going to increase the Central Powers' disadvantages. He does this early, in February, to keep the initiative. He appreciates that the Allies are not going to sit passively by, but are planning to take the land water Germany at the earliest opportunity, and potentially much more effectively than they had done in 1915. So it's actually Falkenhayn who starts the War of Attrition in 1916 with strategic operational uh, attritional campaign engaged to bleed the French army white at Verdun. He wants to break the hearts and minds, as it were, of the army and the French nation. Their fighting power, practically, their will to fight on uh, morally. While not weakening Germany's own forces excessively. But Falkenhayn is adopting a long-term strategy here. Breaking France potentially is going to take some months. In the meantime, Germany is going to have to contain other Allied blows. The Allies aren't going to sit passively and let this happen. This perhaps is an inferiority strategy, to use, use a Napoleonic term, uh, but Falkenhayn had failed to knock Russia out despite the victories in 1915, and indeed failed to knock Serbia out even though the country had been occupied, the Serbians were still in the field. Joffre's response, or more accurately, Joffre's alternative, because he'd already set it up before Verdun started, was to engage his own war of attrition. What Falkenhayn's offensive did was upset Allied military preparations, but it did not alter the fundamental principles of the Allied strategic plan for 1916 which had been agreed in December 1915. Joffre's strategy was also attritional, but he had adopted what I would call a superiority strategy, reflecting the Allies' larger and better mobilised resource base. If you read strategic papers over the winter of 1915-16, and indeed over the winter of 1914-15, they all count up the numbers of men, the resources on either side, and decide, well, we have got so much more, we're going to win this if we uh, engage them properly. What happened in December 1916 was Joffre and other Allied military leaders had adopted uh, attrition as their strategic rationale in something called the General Allied Offensive. I like to ask people what the strategic objective of the Somme Offensive actually was, and nobody can tell me, because it's contained in a document dated 6th of December 1915, and it is the destruction of the German and Austrian armies. Nothing more, nothing less. This is the objective of a concerted Allied 1916 campaign, which will be done through coordinated offensives on all the Allied fronts. Politicians would be expected to endorse this strategic approach, uh, which they did. Uh, this would produce unity in practice, at least for the 1916 campaign. Of course, certain politicians, uh, and these, of course, are the ones with the most strident post-war voices, were hesitant, and they continued to probe strategic policy, which meant translating policy into practice would be difficult, uh, take some months. The timing and the strength of the General Allied Offensive were not determinable in December 1915. Joffre's role, if he had one as strategic coordinator, was not just to come up with a plan, but to keep the plan on track through the, vicissitudes, vic the vicissitudes of German offensives, allied problems, uh, political uh, issues, uh, industrial difficulties. And I think it's a testimony to his skill as a, a soldier and a diplomat and a strategist that he was able to do this, keep the general allied offensive if not on time, then at least more or less on budget when it finally engaged the German army and the Austro-Hungarian army appropriately in the summer and autumn of 1916. The issue, once you've agreed on a strategy of attrition, 
is how do you achieve the attrition of the enemy's armies on the battlefield. This is becoming clearer. I'd like to quote at length from a letter that Joffre wrote to Haig on the 6th of June 1916, shortly after they'd finally agreed that, yes, the offensive would take place at the Somme as soon as possible. Uh, and Joffre wrote, In our joint offensive on the Somme, we can envisage knocking out the German army on the Western Front, or at least an important part of their forces. That sentence was underlined by Haig. But our experience of previous attacks indicates that to drive the enemy from his prepared positions, we have to conduct a long drawn out battle, the final form of which it is impossible to predict. The plan for exploiting our success is essentially a concomitant of the level of attrition of the enemy and their dispositions, as well as our own reserves when we attain the last German position. This is not going to be a quick or an easy battle. It's going to be slow and the key sentence, as well as our reserves when we attain the last German position. It's, it's a war of reserves. Whose reserves can outlast those of the, uh, the enemy in a war of attrition? The Allies, potentially, have got an appropriate method of fighting this sort of battle, which means their reserves will uh, outlast those of the Germans. It's the French method. It's codified by Foch, uh, what he calls the scientific battle. Uh, this doctrine will be applied by French armies on the Somme at Verdun in the second half of 1916, uh, by Fayol and uh, General Nivelle in particular. It meant that the French armies are more military effective in the second half of 1916 than they were in their costly offensives of 1915. It may be hard to see the British offensive on the Somme as an unalloyed victory, uh, in bloody victory, I made the case that an Anglo-French offensive as a whole, reasonably effectively managed by Foch, was a powerful offensive of a new style and it contributed significantly to the strategic objective of the destruction of the German, uh, if not the Austro-Hungarian armies. And we step back from the Somme and we can identify that this element was part of the wider general Allied offensive. A sustained five-month campaign of attrition to overstretch and hopefully destroy uh, the enemy once and for all. Began with the Brusilov Offensive, June, July 1916 in Russia, uh, Russia's most effective offensive, uh, crushed uh, a large section of the Austro-Hungarian armies. Incidentally, it showed that knocking away the props, as Lloyd George argued, had no real effect. Germany just turned up to prop up Austria-Hungary from that point. Russia, unfortunately, was then distracted by propping up Romania. Uh, so, if anything, knocking away the props uh, is a distraction, uh, a distracting strategy, not a decisive strategy. Unfortunately, the Russians only engaged with the Austro-Hungarian army, not the German army. Joffre had expected, hoped, that Russian armies would uh, join in the offensive against Germany, but the Russian northern armies remained distinctly quiescent throughout the second half of 1916. Uh, there was clear limitation in the Chantilly Agreement, which had actually been preferred over a Russian plan for a concerted attack on Austria-Hungary, and it looks like the Russians just went off and followed up that part of the plan in the general ally strategy without engaging uh, with the German army, understandably perhaps given the beating they'd had in 1915 by the Germans. The Italians on the Azonzo uh, were mounting much more offensive operations, in August, they took Gorizia. Uh, they renewed the offensive there three times before the campaigning season ended uh, in October. Again, however, they were taking on the Austro-Hungarian, uh, not the German army, uh, but of course, they weren't in a position to take on the German army on that front. So it's only really the Anglo-French offensive battles, the Somme and Verdun, which becomes an offensive battle for the French, that it were engaged in the destruction of the German army itself, the, the principal adversary, with appropriate method. Uh, by September 1916 on the Somme, uh, Foch is coordinating four Anglo-French armies in an embryonic uh, bataille générale, which will be the method he will use for destroying the whole lot uh, in 1918. The losses of the German army are mounting up, both from the set-piece attacks that the Allies deliver and in the disastrous counterattacks that they uh, try and deliver 
to uh, sustain their defences on the Somme. Uh, we know of uh, what goes wrong on the Allied front, uh, the four division attack by the German army in, uh, I forget the date, I think it's 20, around the 20th of September, which was just destroyed by Allied artillery before it got anywhere near the Allied lines is, uh, is not remembered. 119 German divisions were engaged on the Somme, in addition to those that went through the Meurs Mill uh, on the other side at Verdun. The German irreplaceable casualty figure for 1916 is 1.4 million, uh, 800,000 of those uh, from July onwards. 582,919 is the British official history estimate for the Somme uh, derived from the German Casualty Inquiry Office. This is uh, engaging with this uh, strategy of attrition uh, in depth for the first time. The crisis point for Germany is September. The Somme offensive is renewed in strength. The Italian offensive is renewed in strength. The Romanians come in and they're under pressure from all fronts. There's even, towards the end of the month, an attack on the Bulgarians from Salonika. Uh, slightly belated, not very effective, but Joffre's grand design has come together. Uh, Germany's reaction, uh, I think, smacked to desperation. Hindenburg and Ludendorff uh, are brought in to replace Falkenhayn. This is the roots of the military dictatorship, and I think the roots of internal defeat in Germany. Uh, democratic participation, such as there is in Germany, is uh, thrown away. Uh, in a military authority is entrenched. Uh, interestingly, Russia goes the other way in 1917, uh, but that doesn't ultimately uh, work out. It was winter, and in fact an increasing shortage of immediately available Allied reserves that forced the abandonment of the General Allied Offensive before it had achieved its strategic objective, though it was working very effectively uh, from September towards that purpose, I think. I think it was premature to expect to defeat Germany decisively in 1916. But I'm arguing here that on the balance sheet at the end of the year, the positives produced by the General Allied Offensive were decisively on the Entente side. The icing on the cake, perhaps, is Nivelle's final Verdun counteroffensives, which indicated that Germany has lost the battle there too, uh, significantly with the capture of uh, Fort Duermont and Fort Vaux. <coughs> Secondly, the General Allied Offensive has effectively eliminated the available German strategic reserves. These have to be destroyed in a strategy of attrition. The tactical reserves on the battlefield, the operational reserves in the theatre, but the strategic reserves, the men that Germany can muster year on year to come and reinforce her front lines. Uh, Jack Sheldon elsewhere has elaborated on the manpower crisis that gripped Germany during 1917 as a consequence of the intensified attrition of 1916. If Germany can muster replacements, it's young... Uh, younger boys and older men, it's reformed wounded, it's regraded rear area troops. And this manpower crisis is only partially alleviated by the troops freed up by Russian collapse in 1918, because a lot of the second class troops have gone off the eastern front anyway, uh, so the good troops can come over to the west and contain the Allied offensives of that year. It allows Germany to make one last, last desperate attempt to annihilate the Entente's armies before attrition uh, does its work. Desperate, I think, by 1918, a bit like the Battle of the Bulge in 1944, because the Allies are fully mobilised, uh, American entry has tipped the resource battle decisively against Germany. Thirdly, the military and home front morale of Germany and her allies are now being undermined by constant defeats. Don't underestimate uh, the fact that if your army is losing ground, uh, you don't have any good news to report and your soldiers are very well aware that they can't hold their trenches anymore. Germany makes peace feelers in December 1916, uh, ostensibly as a response to Wilson's initiative, but also, I think, a recognition that Germany did need a peace as soon as possible. She was now losing the war. The Allies certainly believed they were now winning, so they would not consider German terms at this point. 
Germany is forced to make a strategic retreat in the West after a cold, attritional winter campaign continued under remorseless Allied fire on the Somme. Germany had to shorten the line to come up with a strategic reserve to continue the war into another year. Austria-Hungary tried to secure a separate peace, had increasingly to be sustained by German forces and resources. Uh, rightly, Germany, or I forget who the wag was who said we are shackled to a corpse. Was it Falkenheim? But anyway, I think this was coming, a prediction was coming true. Finally, unrestricted submarine warfare was an acknowledgement, I think, the army could not win the land war. Germany was never going to win a maritime war, I think, uh, either. To conclude, it's concerted effort effectively applied, which is the way to win this war. And if 1916 didn't finish it, the General Allied Offensive showed the method. On land, Foch's uh, operational scientific battle and Bataille General operational uh, strategy, it showed the strategic method attrition. And it was on land that the war would ultimately be decided. But the Allied actions on the other four fronts in that year laid the proper foundations for this strategy and for ultimately a victory. Victory would depend on the slow strangulation of the enemy, alliance with military, economic, maritime and diplomatic power. Effectively, we are engaged in a huge siege in which the walls are being continuously assaulted at different points, with more and more material being employed to strengthen those assaults until the walls are going to crumble. Not a surprise, actually, in 1918, they all crumble at the same time. The walls are still standing in December 1916, but they've taken an intensive battering in that year. The cracks are getting larger and more difficult, if not impossible, to repair. I think to grasp the idea of victory in 1916, or indeed in the war, we need to reject the prevailing image of a geographical war, the idea of Easterners versus Westerners as the determinants of strategy. We need to assess, instead, progress and achievement in a modern war of resources and of war efforts, with attrition at its centre. On balance, it doesn't look like the Entente is winning. The Germans, as the war goes on, seem to be able to take countries, while the Allies are struggling to take villages. But the war would be won, as Charteris wrote on the 30th of June 1916, on the eve of the Somme Offensive, by killing Germans. And by the end of 1916, Germans are finally being killed at such a rate that an additional victory was in the Allies' grasp. This is thanks to fuller mobilisation and a concerted strategic plan sustained by economic, maritime, diplomatic strength and unity. Asquith, British Prime Minister, who's responsible for the first half of the British war effort, during which she had to engage haltingly with this war of attrition, did come to understand the strategy and what was happening in 1916, if others did not. I'd like to quote from uh, General Godley's memoirs. Uh, he was commanding the New, New Zealand Division in 1916, uh, and he recalls a conversation with Asquith, uh, probably when he, Asquith visited the Somme Front. And the Prime Minister... Godley records, harped on a great deal on the fact that what the British public wanted to hear of was geographical gains of towns and territory on a large scale and large bags of prisoners. And that a successful fight that only involved an advance of a couple of thousand yards and the slaughter of a large number of Germans did not appeal to them. They wanted something tangible. There you have it, the slaughter of a large number of Germans. This is the central principle of attrition boldly stated by the British Prime Minister. And the problem is, as we know, it involved the reciprocal sacrifice of a large, and up to this point, actually generally greater number of Englishmen, Frenchmen, and indeed anyone else who took on the tactically effective German army. It would never be an easy or a bloodless victory, therefore, for either side. As well as costing the Entente hugely in lives, the more concerted, intensive effort of 1916 does bring the Entente to the brink of bankruptcy as well. 
Essentially, Britain and France are now in hock to the United States. So there are definitely Pyrrhic elements to this victory. Uh, I'm happy, happy to admit that. But when are there not Pyrrhic, Pyrrhic elements to any victory? But I think the case I'm trying to make is that in 1916, the Entente got the principles and practices of mass warfare correct on all five fronts. Thereafter, it was only a matter of applying them more efficiently and effectively. But I want to conclude by suggesting that the victory of 1916 was wasted. At the end of that year, the quick fixers with old-fashioned ideas of war and strategy replaced the successful attritionists, Asquith and Joffre, a Kitchener, another attritionist, uh, we had lost in June. General Nivelle, Joffre's replacement, reverted to a disastrous breakthrough strategy in the land campaign. Interestingly, when Nivelle was removed in May, a policy of attrition was adopted again. Uh, Joffre had advocated intensified attrition as the way to end the war, building on his general Allied offensive in 1916 for the strategy for early 1917. Lloyd George, who replaced Asquith, did not understand the strategy of the war he took over or the way to end it quickly. Henry Wilson's advice to him was, we'll end this war with two Somme's at once. He wasn't going to have any of that. Lloyd George had been complaining to the Cabinet in November 1916 that, and I quote, the enemy had in his occupation more territory than ever before, and he still had some four million of reserves. How then, Mr Lloyd George asked, is the war to be brought to an end? This, from Lloyd George, is a note of despair, rather than a recognition that potentially another four million Germans and allies had to be slaughtered to end the war. It's stark, but it's true. If that was too high, high a price to pay, then peace had to be made, and it was not. But arguably, thereafter, Lloyd George continued questing after tangibles. Vienna, Jerusalem, even Ostend and Zeebrugge. Uh, his premiership, therefore, I think, delayed rather than facilitated victory. Perhaps a subject for another lecture, not mine. <laughs> By not rapidly exploiting the advantages gained in 1916. Certainly, Lloyd George himself is very sensitive to the human sacrifice that this would inevitably entail, uh, but it's a harsh reality of modern war that casualties are going to be huge, uh, and casualties remain huge, whatever Lloyd George's strategic approach. I don't think it's, he saved lives by extending the war uh, if he carried on uh, with the attritional strategy, might have ended much more quickly. Lloyd George's arch enemy, Haig, on the other hand, appreciated what his armies and his allies had done to Germany in 1916. If you read his dispatch on the Somme, uh, it ends with a confident and it turns out a quite justified boast. The enemy's power has not yet been broken, nor is it yet possible to form an estimate of the time the war may last before the objects for which the Allies are fighting have been attained. But the Somme battle has placed beyond doubt the ability of the Allies to gain those objects. Haig knew that this was the right strategy and it would decide the war in the Entente's favour. Churchill, actually, had identified at the end of 1915 his resignation speech that in the war, sorry, that in this war, the tendencies are far more important than the episodes. Uh, he did thereafter become a great critic of certain episodes, mind you, and he's responsible for some of the worst episodes himself, I think. <laughs> We should also recognise that the war is actually still expanding in 1916 and into 1917. You're not going to finish it in 1916. And in this, Lloyd George, I think, is right when, when he writes uh, at the end of 1916, the success of war of attrition depends upon the time it takes and who can last out the longest. It would take two more years. There would be anxious moments. Uh, Haig himself actually qualified his dispatched privately uh, will win if Russia stays in. Russia did not. But Allied coherence was deepening in 1917 and 1918. They were more resilient after the shocks and the remobilisation of 1917. They therefore proved stronger, better able to outlast the central powers in a war in which resilience was a third element of strategy. In the next war, and with a certain amount of 
uh, rhetorical license. Churchill wrote famously of the turning of the tide in 1942. Before Alamein, we never had a victory. After Alamein, we never had a defeat. 1916, actually, if you read what people are writing at the end of the year, is recognised at the time on both sides of the line as the turning point of this war. How long the war would last remains uncertain. What the, co what the final cost of victory would be was certainly feared. But the Allies would win through with some defeats, but with many more victories thereafter, if only they held together individually and collectively. And I'll leave it to our next speaker to explain that. Thank you. Mademoiselle from Armatiers.